okay? Yes. Great. Just want to do that one quick check. All right. Well, uh, good good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, as uh, as Jeff has men mentioned, I'll be presenting fundamentals of gas flow using clamp on ultrasonic flow meters. Um, I'm Martin Dingman, uh, you know, in this industry for uh, 30 plus years now. And I uh, started with uh, Controltron back in the early 90s, 91 actually, uh, which, you know, working with clamp on ultrasonic flow meters as of this January is 30 years. So I used to say, hey, wow, who's all the people that were working there for 20, 30 years at that time, who would work for a company that long? Well, here I am. Um, I guess it's a testament of a good company. I think even, even on the Gilson side, uh, you know, many uh, employees there that have been working, you know, 20, 30 plus years. So when you got a good company to work for you, you find out that you stay there. So joining with me today is Ron McCarthy. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, has uh, 45 plus years in this industry as well. And, uh, you know, what I'm looking to do here is, is go over uh, the fundamentals of gas flow using, you know, clamp on ultrasonic flow meters. And my goal is to, uh, you know, give us much knowledge for those that may not that may have some basic, intermediate, or advanced knowledge. Martin, you cut out there just because we had to mute from the background noise. So oh, I Right. So, yeah, so what I was saying is just the goal here, basically, is for everyone that took the time to join us today, those that may not be familiar with this technology or have some basic, intermediate, or advanced knowledge that I can I can give you uh, a little bit more uh, information to uh, to help as well. So, with that, I'll get started. Uh, quick agenda. I'm going to start off with a clamp on ultrasonic gas flow measurement overview. You know, kind of get grounded with, uh, with some de definitions. Uh, go over some of the, the basic key benefits and uh, what the system comprises of as far as the system components, get into the principle of operation, talk about gas properties, look into a little bit on the field installations, um, and then the field installation information and required accessories that um, are required for a successful installation. Then that's basically on the on the field installed side. Then I'm going to take all that that we've learned there and bring that over to how we can apply that to custody transfer, meeting AGA-9 guidelines, um, kind of wrap up at the end with those critical diagnostics, you know, what you want to look for to make sure you're having a, a reliable measurement. You know, there could be some hands exchanging product. It could be for, for balancing and so forth. And then kind of wrap up with a summary and, and a QA. and a we'll, we'll pause during a couple of slides during the presentation to take any questions as well uh, as those questions come up. Uh, to start off, clamp on. You know, when we talk about clamp on, we're referring to a field installed meter. Uh, so the, way, the way I like to explain that is when you're buying a clamp on flow meter, you're buying half the flow meter. You know, what, what's the other half of the meter? The other half is your, your existing pipe. So, you know, we're, we're working with uh, some of the unknowns. You know, we could, we could look and have a long, you know, a lot of pipe diameters or what have you, but we don't know what's going on inside that pipe. You know, we don't know the exact critical dimensions. We know the OD, the wall thickness, but those can all vary based on tolerances. There could be buildup. Maybe there's no conditioning. So typically you're looking at a half to 1% of rate or better. But again, we're working with some things that we're, we're unsure of. Uh, the transducers are mounted externally, so it's very flexible and convenient, uh, having the ability to not tap into the line. And you're not going to get a flow calibration certificate with that because it's really not made it to any spool or what have you. We can have the meter calibrated to show its performance, but um, typically uh, that calibration would be non-transferable. But then you take that same technology, um, and, and let me rewind a little bit. We look at ultrasonics for, for gas. So that we, when, when I was back with Controlatron, um, that was back in 1971, we released the first clamp on ultrasonic gas meter. Um, and in the mid 90s is when the inline and our clamp on ultrasonic meters started to come to market. Um, and then in 2006, um, Siemens had acquired us. So you take that clamp on technology and you put that with a spool meter run with flow conditioning in accordance with AGA 9 guidelines. 
and now you can achieve that custody transfer accuracy. You know, any clamp on or insert cordal technology, and that's mainly in the industry, you're gonna see the insert cordal technology. Uh, but, but by putting together that meter run, you're eliminating those field installed uncertainties. You, you've literally got your head into the pipe, you've got centricity, and we'll talk about all that. And then with the clamp on transducers, we've got you know, mounting assemblies that are welded onto the pipe, and then you've got that calibration certificate that shows the uncertainty um, as found and as left after calibration. So the benefits, non-intrusive, having that ability to go anywhere along a pipeline and be able to, uh, to, to check a meter that might be in question, to do lost and unaccounted for studies. Um, you don't have to cut the pipe or shut that process down. Uh, and that's key. And there's a cost savings with that and having that flexibility of, uh, of not also being um, more flexible in, in where you apply the installations. And we can measure liquids and gases. You know, so we're here we'll talk about, you know, we'll talk about natural gas. I'll touch a little bit on uh, liquid hydrocarbons and, and how we correct the pressures and temperatures to get the type of reading that you might be looking for. And it's a low installation cost. Uh, if you're doing leak detection, you know, being able to put these along a pipeline and be able to monitor, uh, do balancing, look for any um, balance upstream or downstream without having to cut into those pipes. Um, and on, on a gas line, measuring about two inch up to 52 inch for liquids, up to 360 inch. Uh, you get no pressure drop or energy loss. There's nothing inside that's gonna move, wear or foul. And the benefit there too is in, in a lot of the pipelines where they, they're going to be pigged, um, you're not gonna be able to have that flexibility of doing that with a turbine meter or an orifice meter. So now you have a full bore piece of piping with the transducers external. Uh, and being that it doesn't have the moving parts, you're gonna be able to maintain that calibration. And probably one of the other major benefits is the wide turndown ratio. Um, you know, we typically like to have a velocity above two feet per second on gas, one foot uh, for, uh, for liquids, but we can measure down to zero. So it's a high sensitivity of measurement. So if you're checking valves, you can still check to see if there's any flow there. And then we've actually had our gas meter tested up to 130 feet per second. So very wide turn down ratio. Uh, system components, you've got your transmitter. Um, here we're just showing some of the, the transducers and some of the mounting configuration um, along with the spacer bar. So when you're programming the transmitter out in the field, putting some of the key information in such as the pipe material, it's OD, it's wall thickness, and a lot of those are pre-selected with drop down menus. The medium that you're measuring, whether it's a liquid or gas, it will do all the calculations to properly space those transducers. And we provide the spacer bar as a tool so you don't have to go out with a tape measure. You'll have a reference and an index that can easily space those transducers. And we've got various different mounting assemblies depending on how robust uh, you want that assembly to be. Here's just a basic uh, mounting frame with straps. We've got stainless steel high precision mounts that can be welded onto the pipe. And then we, um, here I'm showing an, an RTD where we're doing some correction for uh, speed of sound changes in the pipe wall and the transducer to make sure we're getting an accurate measurement. But we're also using that temperature sensor to, uh, to do some standard volume measurement uh, when we're out in the field. Uh, just looking at the, the principle of operation, I like to use this example as a river. Uh, we're measuring a delta time. That, Difference, that difference in time is proportional to the velocity. And once you know that inside area, you can calculate the flow rate. So if I look at a river here, flowing from left to right, you know, downstream is going to be accelerated with the current, and then going upstream, you're going to be decelerated going against the current. Um, that difference in time is then proportional to the velocity. So we're, we're making a velocity measurement for that cross-sectional area. A couple of mounting configurations that you'd see uh, that we would be doing an installation for. Uh, the first one we talk about is reflect, and that's exactly what we're doing here. We're, we're reflecting off the far wall. So you've got a pair of transducers that are in the same plane that are spaced apart on the same side of the pipe that are both transmitting and receiving an, an ultrasonic signal. Benefits of reflect mount, it's a lot easier to install. 
you know, you don't have transistors on the opposite side, and I'll show that configuration. You've got a lot of other benefits too, because we're also correcting for cross flow. An ultrasonic meter expects axial flow, where in many cases, depending on where you're located on a pipeline, you could be coming off of an elbow, such as the bottom right hand corner, and you're going to have that increased angle and decreased angle on the upstream and the downstream. So that gets negated in a direct mount configuration. The other benefit is you're in the medium twice as long as you would be in other configurations, which I'll show you on the next slide. So you've got that much more sampling that you're getting um, in addition and covering that much more area and time. In a direct mount configuration, it's a little bit more difficult to, to install. You've got the transducers 180 degrees apart, so you have to make sure that those are properly spaced, and we've got the tools to do that. You are in the medium uh, half the amount of time. In addition to that, you're not correcting for any of that non-axial flow or cross flow. So there are some downsides to going to a direct mount, but there are also some upsides. The upside is you might have an application that doesn't warrant reflect mount. And what I mean by that is you could have some type of a buildup, maybe there's something um, you know, along that pipe wall that's, that's attenuating your signal, that's not allowing you to get that reflection and have that double pass in the pipe. So typically on a, on a um, direct mount, it's more on those troublesome applications. Or if you're putting them on something that's non-metallic, such as plastics, you're not going to get that reflection, so you would mount it in a direct mount configuration. But to overcome some of the things with direct mount where you don't have the, um, the negating or the correction for cross flow, we can do what's called direct X, which is equivalent to a reflect mount, where you've got two sets of transducers that are both measuring upstream and downstream in direct, and those both being averaged out will correct for that cross flow. So a lot of different variations in how the technology and the transducers can be applied on your applications. Um, looking at the uh, you know, principles of the flow profile. Uh, most flow meter types require sufficient straight run. You know, here I'm showing some examples, uh, one of an out of plane elbow and a single elbow. And I'll show you some studies that we've done at laboratories later in the slide deck. But an anaplane elbow requires 40 plus diameters just to get that propagating swirl out and get a, full, a swirl out to get that fully developed flow profile. And a single elbow, you can see the effects aren't so bad. You know, those will, those will pretty much uh, about you know, 10 or 20 pipe diameters would be sufficient on gas. And that's about uh, you know, 10 or 15 pipe diameters for liquids. You know, being that, uh, you know, gas has a, has a low viscosity, uh, so it's typically in that turbulent flow, but it also requires longer straight runs in order to get that fully developed flow profile. Uh, just looking here real quick, uh, you know, just going over some of the, the calculations that are being done on the principles of operation. Um, you know, what we're doing here is that every piece of material has a, has a different sound property. So the transducer block has a, uh, has a phase velocity along with the pipe wall. And what we're doing when we're measuring natural gas and liquid hydrocarbons is we're, we're generating a lamb wave signal, which is different than, than shear mode. And in order to get a lamb wave, which we call wide beam, we need to have a 90 degree signal injection into that pipe wall. So we utilize what's called Snell's law, Snell's law of refraction. So we've got a particular phase velocity and angle in the transducer block to get that 90 degrees into the pipe wall to give us that refraction angle into the, to the medium of gas. And you'll notice with gases, it's a much steeper refraction angle than with liquids. And that's because the sound speed is, is much slower, but you're also spending that much more time in the pipe. So what we're looking to measure here is take out the time in the pipe wall in the transducer block and just calculate the delta time in the medium. While we're doing that, we're also measuring the sound speed of that, of that gas as well. 
looking at different path configurations and showing you the differences between clamp on diametral and I say diametral because we're always going to be crossing that middle section or that cross sectional layer of the pipe and your inline transducers uh, which are typically used for for custody transfer for you know back in the late 90s early 2000 which is cordal so here in diametral you can see different configurations where we're cutting through the center of the pipe and cordal is just that they're cords they're single uh, think of them as a as a, like our direct mount configuration where they're just transmitting and receiving in that one direction and they're much more susceptible to cross flow and that's why you can see here in cd and e you start to require a lot more inline transducers to correct for all those uh you know those conditions that you may have upstream of the transducers and here we can show you with wide beam in the center picture, you can see that nice, clear, coherent, reinforced signal and that wide beam effect that's given us 20 times the volume of a typical insert system. So some of our configurations, as you can see on the, on the right, you've got either a dual path or a four path. So dual path, you can see the amount of area that's being covered. And then with a four path, you got four pair of transducers that are covering that much more area. And those are all being averaged out to increase your accuracy. So, you know, you've got a lot more sampling and averaging with greater precision, um, especially with the Siemens FS230 um, at 100 hertz, you're getting 100 measurements per second as well on top of covering that much area. So you've got that greater cross-sectional area averaging, uh, definitely an improved repeatability and accuracy. It does add that redundancy if a transducer set did fail the other three are still averaging and you've got more time in the flow stream. So uh, the speed of sound of, of natural gas being much lower than liquid, you're already in that medium that much more longer, getting that much more sampling data, but then being able to cover that much more area in the pipe with a dual and a four path, you're able to correct um, and cancel out a lot of the uh, flow effects. This just gives you an illustrated example. Let me see if we can see it, uh, both transmitting upstream and downstream. And you can see that wide band in the medium. That's so going downstream, and now we're going to transmit and receive upstream. And we're doing that 100 times a second. Uh, some of the other effects, uh, and, the, and these effects will affect an insert quartal meter a lot more than it will with a uh, clamp on ultrasonic wide beam lamb wave technology is beam blowing. You know, when you get into that, those much higher velocities, that beam starts to get blown down the pipeline. So I'll show you during normal flow conditions, we've got a known transmit and an expected receive. You can see the transmit and receive is, is being sent to each of the transducers. But once that velocity starts picking up, you can see the downstream signal is blown away a little bit, but it's still being picked up by the downstream transducer. And then the upstream going against the flow is being pushed away, but being the fact that we've got that utilizing Snell's law and that refraction angle and getting that 90 degree into the pipe wall and getting that lamb wave, we're still able to make that measurement as that signal travels along that pipe wall. And we can see this in our diagnostics. So if you see here to the left, this is our, our signal receive wave shape. So we've got five cycles of transmit and receive here. And what we do is we do what's called a correlation cue. We correlate the upstream and the downstream receive signal. And on the right here, you can see the difference in the wavelength. That difference in the wavelength is showing that distortion and that beam blowing effect. And that's where we've got the ability to put an HF factor in there, which corrects for those higher flow velocities. Um, so showing here over at TransCanada Calibration, many years back, um, you can see some of this data here where we did some calibration with a uh, flow conditioner in there, but we removed the flow conditioner to get to those higher flow velocities. And at 130 feet per second without a flow conditioner and no correction, that was the as found data point right on that zero. Now an inline transducer 
would typically be blown away because it, it doesn't have a pipe wall to take that signal and have that reinforced wavefront to travel to the transducer. It would be blown away and, and missed. Um, looking at some of the installation considerations. So out of the box accuracy, you know, here we're talking about applying this technology to an existing pipeline, typically half to 1% or better. You know, we've mounted on uh, meter runs where we've got home piece of piping and we're, we're checking against a custody transfer meter and we're within a tenth of a percent. Uh, so it, it all depends on what you have upstream, what conditions you have, uh, what velocities and, 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 and what disturbances may be there. Um, our sensors are matched to the to the wall, the pipe wall, the material. So if you've got a, a 10 inch standard wall, 0.375 wall, we've got a known uh, frequency that we match. And that's what gives us that lamb wave or that wide beam. You know, not only are we using the different laws like Snell's law, but we're, we're matching the resonant frequency of that pipe, not a harmonic. Um, it's not a one size fits all, we're applying it. So our transducers are very specific to that wall thickness. And that's what allows us to measure natural gas and steel pipes. We got uh, minimum line pressures of about 100 PSI on steel pipes. In some cases that might be a little bit higher and I'll show you that on the next slide. But the reason that's higher is those are gonna be heavier wall pipes anyway, which are designed for higher pressure gas. So that should fit in line. But when we need to get down to lower pressure, we can mount on plastic piping or kynar and actually get down to atmospheric or vacuum. So it's not a limitation in our engineering or, or technology, it's physics. It, it comes down to the sonic impedance of the gas and the steel. And that's why we require the, uh, the pressure to, uh, to get that density, to change that sonic impedance in order to get our signal through there. Um, and we actually utilize a, uh, a damping film on the outside of the pipe just to make sure that we don't have any ringing in the pipe wall that's gonna generate noise. So for gases, two to 52 inches. For liquids, we get down to a half inch up to 360 inch. And when we look at pipe conditions, uh, the pipe should be generally in good condition. You don't wanna have any kind of scaling or rust. You wanna clean that off, have it nice and smooth. But if you've got a good painted um, applied epoxy that's bonded well to the pipe, we can mat right onto that that uh, that will not provide any issues just to get plenty of signal and amplitude. Um, temperature ranges for liquid, we go up to 450 uh, for, for gases, uh, 250 Fahrenheit, and uh, velocity uh, up to that data there, we had at 130 feet per second. Ron on the call, I know he's tested uh, higher than that. I think, what was that, Ron, 150? He might be on mute, so I'll let him get back to that. Um, and then gas properties, uh, you, you know, we want to have less than 15% CO2. CO2 can be very attenuative to the ultrasonic signal, but we've tested up to 15%. Um, and as I mentioned a few seconds ago, the pipe damping material, which improves that signal to noise ratio. Um, and this just shows some of the, the guidelines that we use. Uh, we have an FS200 utility tool that ultimately that will give you the uh, the precise pressure that you require. But you can see here, if you've got a 10 inch, which would be a standard wall, say a standard wall pipe that would require a D1, you know, the minimum pressure would be 200 PSI. And many of the applications that we may be on are gonna be well within that. But if you start getting to a six inch um, pipe that would require D1H, that's a much heavier wall. So that's like an extra heavy. You can see that's 350 PSI but that is designed for heavier, higher pressure. So that's probably gonna be around there or more. And on the bottom is just a, a chart that shows the various transducer size and the wall match for each of them. So D1H 0.32 to 0.44 for, for all your standard wall piping, that would be the most common transducer. All right, so let's talk a little bit about gas properties um, and our measurement capability. You know, what, can we, what can we do with a gas meter out in the field? Well, we can measure the actual gross volume. Uh, that's just corrected for viscosity. So you can see here in this equation, we're showing you volume um, you know, equals a constant Reynolds number, you know, timing that, but multiplying that by pi, four times the diameter squared times that velocity. And that equation to the right, is the Reynolds number equation, and that little character on the bottom is, is viscosity. 
And then we've got the ability to do standard volume flow. So we can put in, there's, there's a standard AGAA table that covers uh, the, the, a, a very common, let's say a molecular structure, or you can program uh, an AGA table and upload that. And now what we do is we take that Q actual formula up above and we correct that for pressure and temperature uh, based on the Z factors of that mole fraction. And then we've also got the ability to do it in a mass flow where we're actually taking the standard volume and correcting it for density. This is a typical table that's, that's this is a generic table that's in our meter, which is a typical natural gas composition. So if we turn that AGAA table on and we have a, a live pressure and temperature input, it will continually apply the apply the Z factors and give you an, an accurate standard volume measurement. Now that's a fixed composition that's not going to vary. So in many cases, uh, you know, our instrument might be put in the field on a, on a gas application, taking the basic actual gross volume flow into a flow computer, bring it back to a SCADA, and then dynamically correcting that with the, uh, with a you know, chromatograph out in the field for the changing composition and pressure and temperature. And the reason we do that, when you look at compressibility factor for natural gas, it's not linear. As pressure and temperature changes, you can see the swing in the uh, in the Z factors. So on this slide, I kind of give you a, a look of you know, what does that look like? It's a very intense table um, that complies with AGA8 and AGA8. 10, which is compressibility factor and speed of sound. So here on the compressibility factor, based on the pressure and temperature and composition, it's applying all those corrections. And then we're also verifying the speed of sound and making sure that that is correct for that, uh, that, that gas composition. Um, I talked a lot about natural gas. I put a couple slides in here um, in regards to uh, the liquids. And I, you know, I want to talk about liquid hydrocarbons. So for those that might be on the line that um, you know, dealing with liquid hydrocarbons, you know, what we found many years ago is that they behave in a, in a linear fashion where they have a, a very unique sonic signature, whether it's a, a crude or a refined product. Um, but they're, and they all, they're all affected by temperature and pressure the same. So we found that Every one of these products here, as an example, as I said, have their own sonic signature, but every one degree Fahrenheit, they all change 2.3 meters per second in sound speed. So we're able to bring every product back to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see on this line where they're all, they all have their own sound speed at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which we call liquid then, which is our liquid identification. So when you can, identify that liquid if you've got a multi-product pipeline, we can then correct for the measurement by giving you a mass or a standard volume measurement. So in this case, you know, we were looking over on the, on the prior slide, liquid then of 1410 is a low sulfur diesel. Well, now we know it's specific gravity, we know it's viscosity, it's slope, and with live pressure and temperature, we can actually accurately provide a standard volume or a uh, mass volume output and being able to identify different products as well and utilizing it as an interface detector between different products. So Martin, we do have one question. I do want to say thank you to, to Eric for answering everything in the chat. Oh, uh, the one remaining is, will this work on a rectangular duct? On a rectangular duct, no, unfortunately. Uh, this is all for just, uh, you know, diametral measurement, um, you know, piping, but not for duct work. Uh, talk a little bit about the gas properties and the gas and liquid comparisons. Um, if you look at the fluid sound velocity uh, between water, oil, uh, you know, and gas, we're looking at, you know, hydrocarbons around 1,200, water 1500 meters per second and gas you can see at, at 400 meters per second so we're we're spending you know we're about four times the amount of time in the pipe 
And the difference in that beam angle, that refraction angle, you know, 40, 30, 45 to seven degrees. So, uh, you know, big differences in, in how they behave. And, and going into how they behave, this is some of the testing that I mentioned on some of the earlier slides for natural gas, how many pipe diameters you required in order to get a, uh, a fully developed flow profile. So here's some testing we did many years back on 870 pound, eight inch carbon steel, schedule 40 stock pipe. This was over at Nova, which is uh, now part of uh, its Trans Canada calibrations. And you can see here, we did a test on a single 90 degree elbow and out of the box performance without any correction at four diameters, we're you know, negative 3.3, but you can see it took about 20 or so pipe diameters in order for it to, to correct out to get to about a tenth of a percent. But then the dual elbow, like I mentioned, you know, the effect here took 40 pipe diameters. So these were all based on live studies that we did to accumulate this data. And that's without any flow correction, that's just on a pipe point. So if you've got those convoluted, you know, piping configurations when you're out in the field, you, you wanna get as, as, as much, you know, upstream uh, pipe diameters as possible. But we do have some ways of correcting that. Um, you know, in the Siemens meter, we do have a patented pipe configuration menu that is bi-directional that gives the, the trans, transmitter the smarts to know where the transducers, transducers are located and what is going on upstream and downstream of the transducers. So we can put into the transmitter the pipe anomalies upstream and downstream. So if you only have 10 up, five down, if it's a bi-directional application, you might have a, a reducer or an expander or a double elbow at a plane. It will dynamically correct the Reynolds number that's being applied to uh, to bring that accuracy in tighter. <clears throat> Look at some of the uh, uh, field installations uh, to the left. You know, plenty of straight run. Uh, doesn't look like there's any bad place to mount on that piece of piping. Um, and to the right, uh, doing lost and unaccounted for studies. You know, a quick mount, spring-loaded transducers. You know, a transmitter. You know, mounted inside of a, a vehicle and just driving over to uh, various storage wells to uh, to take to take some measurements. But let's look at locations. You know, we talked a lot about swirl and what have you, but if you look at the picture to the left, that is probably the worst location anything can be mounted in, um, or any flow meter for that matter. Horrible location, but to the right, plenty of upstream piping, uh, good location. Um, so that would be an excellent location. And it all comes down for field installation is, is understanding the application, you know, what's going on upstream of the transducer and the proper location of those transducers. And that's really where the time has to be spent. Uh, here's an installation where this was bi-directional. Uh, we had about one diameter up and downstream uh, for the meter, but there was a two and a half percent bias. Uh, it's it's not even one diameter, Marty. No, it's not half even. A <laughs> half a diameter. Yeah. Uh, so they were running this for months and they had that constant two and a half bias that they were either, and that was even with the pipe configuration menu. So that, this, this wasn't one of those best applications to, to utilize that. And you can see on the, the right hand picture, that configuration is, is less desirable than the one on the, on the left. You know, if we were just flowing from left to right, that, that would have been much, uh, much better, but they made that adjustment. Uh, based it's on bi directional that, that site as well. Right. Thank Believe you. So, yes. And that's uh, that's still running today, right, Ron? Yeah, it is. Uh, what they did is they ran it for about a year, found out what the accuracy or inaccuracy was, and then they did a one time adjustment and they basically put a plus two and a half percent bias on the thing, and it runs fine now. And uh, it's, it's their balance point on South Texas pipeline. And the alternative was they were gonna to have to pull the pipe by the field next door, pop straight line pipe in there, cost them about five and a half to $10 million to do what we did there with you know, basically a simple clamp on. Wow, that was great, thank you. I've, I've, I've got my microphone back. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I lost you before, it was okay. Yeah, it, 
I, I it got bl blocked on the far the other end. So it worked today. And here's a, here's another example too of of what can go wrong, and and how to use the transmitter as a check meter. You know why you need a check meter. Uh, but this particular one was dirty gas. So this was a 12 inch pipe that had about a tenth of an inch buildup, which changed the cross sectional area or the inside diameter or area. Um, but what was also happening here, and you can see by the, the plate that was pulled up, is you had a lot of swirl. So this was one of those applications where, you know, it took them over time to extend that, that section of piping, put in a CPA plate, put in some filtration. Um, and, and this was an actual billing meter, and then it took them straight pipe as well. Yeah, how many years did it take them before they could actually get that? <clears throat> that eight measure? years. Eight years. Yeah, they, it was an international crossing. All right, it was between uh, Texas and Mexico. And any of you guys that are in measurement and get involved in anything like that, you realize that if you want to change something by eight and a half percent, you don't do it overnight because you're going to end the the rest of your life in uh, court. So you just slowly move it over a time period and that's how they they, they adjusted it. So not exactly nice, but uh, <laughs> that's the only way you can do it. And this is a 42 inch field clamp on over at CC that uh, actually controls the flow through their laboratory. Which yep. we still have installed today. You can see a close up here. And been that's out there for twenty some years. It's been a while now, I know, right? And, yeah, and no on here, you know, I mentioned the damping material that we provide. Uh, you know, we also can utilize a gray size of water shield in other products, and that's what we have on uh, on this piece of pipe here. That's the damping material for the transducers I mentioned. Um, and a couple of other field installs, buried pit over to the left. Uh, you know, anytime we're putting something on the ground, it doesn't. We don't want to have it backfilled. We would like to have an enclosure around it, so if any of that shifting of the earth, you know, would would move or, or break the transducers and the and the bands, um, and then here we've got a, a a verification of a custody transfer meter, and over to the right, just an in, you know, installation at at the lab, which we've you know spent many many of hours and and over the years at, at laboratories to to do testing and and provide the test results we're we're showing and sharing here today. Yeah, that was actually the meter that we did the 130 feet on. This one to the right. Yeah. And that was a few years ago because we used to use pink <laughs> damping material then. But a lot of guys didn't like that, so it's now clear. So. Perfect. Thank you, Ron. Um, and then field field installation required accessories. Uh, what you want to you want to make sure you do the best you can if you if you're looking to get accuracy on a field installed meter is is measuring the the thickness of the gauge you can use all the drawings and it could say a 10 inch standard wall pipe with a 0.375 wall uh, but we know there are going to be some tolerances there and it may be a little out of round uh, so you want to measure the outside pipe diameter with pipe tape um, use a thickness gauge to go around the pipe to kind of get an idea of what that wall thickness is and average that out and a level to make sure that the transducers are are mounted perfectly and level. And you know we've we've developed a tool that you can use your thickness gauge in various locations. So if you look at the section of the illustration of the piping, A, B, and C, getting 12 measurements around each of those sections, plugging that data into the spreadsheet, and it automatically will calculate an average wall thickness and using that. That's the best you can do without actually cutting into the pipe and looking on, looking in to see what else is going on and measure the cross-sectional area uh, if there's any buildup. So, you know, for field installs, those are still unknowns. Those are, those are things that you, you just can't um, figure out. But the best you can do from the outside is to do all the due diligence of, you know, getting a, a, a straight piece of, of, of run and making all those extra measurements to uh, get as precise as you can. And then we have uh, application data sheets, which are helpful for us to learn and understand your application to make sure one that we can measure on that application and two that we're providing the proper um, 
you know, instrumentation, but also these are great questions to help you as well uh, look at some of the things that might not come to mind that, oh, you know, hey, the pressure, the temperature, what, you know, what's the molecular structure and understanding what, uh, what we can or may not be able to do for that application. Um, and then, you know, when we start talking about custody transfer, that's where we start getting our head into the pipe. You know, everything that I spoke of on the prior slides were all field installations, a lot of unknown. We know some things, but there are a lot of things we do not know. But when you have the opportunity to get into a section of piping, have that section honed, have a perfect concentricity, have an engineered a precise measurement for a sectional area, that's where true accuracy will come in. Um, it's, it's the error is not in the transmitter. It's, it's in the measurement and how it's being applied to a spool, an existing piece of pipe or a meter run. The theory of inline transducers or clamp-on transducers, we're, we're doing the same measurement. It's delta time. We're just doing it differently. You know, inline transducers are, are that, they're inline. They're exposed to the medium. You know, there are some things that they're subject to as far as any type of buildup and stuff like that. And, that, and the external clamp-on transducers, that they are that, they're external. Um, and we, we're transmitting through a pipe wall. So there are pros and cons to, to both technologies, but they both can achieve custody transfer accuracy when you have a precise meter run. So to the left, I, you know, I show in a picture here that we just saw a little while ago of that, that, that straight run of piping. You know, looking at the drawing, say I have a 10-inch standard wall pipe, and over to the right, you can see a field install. Uh, this is an international installation where you've got a, a meter run with the upstream conditioner and, and so forth. You know, all the measurements have been made prior to it uh, being installed out in the field, um, and it was calibrated as well. So what we had done um, a few months back is, uh, you know, we worked with a with a, with a midstream company and a third party uh, fabrication uh, house that built a 16 inch meter run that was precisionally honed. It had a precise concentricity, so we had a precise cross sectional area. And with that, you can see in the bottom here, it was unidirectional. So we had uh, UL1 and UL2 or 10 pipe diameters each. And in between those, we put in a CPA plate. Uh, we had five pipe diameters downstream. And that meter run, we had a dual path meter, which we sent out to CC for calibration. And here you can see, you know, there's a couple steps before the calibration. And one of those steps was in order to meet that AGA9 accuracy, meters at a 12 inch and larger um, shall have a maximum error of 0.7% as found. And we were better than a half percent as found, which got us into the next step, which was the actual calibration where we put in a, uh, an eight-point multi-point uh, linear interpolation, which linear, lin linearized the flow rate uh, from the upper to lower flow range, and you can see uh, from some of the the uh, the sample data that we took, we were better than a tenth of a percent. So that shows through the range of the meter as well. Through the through the entire range of the meter, yes. Thank you, Ron. So by taking that unknown and making it known. That's so, you know, everything I'm trying to say here is, you know, the error really lies on the, the, the piping pipe. and the meter run, you know, and, and, and all those conditions that are happening upstream. And in some cases, you know, some companies will actually uh, go even above this and actually put all the upstream conditions in there as well. Uh, but in many cases, this will negate or take out most of, most of those errors. Um, and then just to wrap up at the very end, you know, the critical diagnostics and, and you know, why, why diagnostics are critical? A couple reasons. One, you in some cases, you're, you're changing hands. There's money being changed back and forth. So you want to make sure you, you, you're having accurate measurement if it's custody transfer. Um, I like to talk about one story where, you know, we work with Williams Pipeline that they actually expand their pipeline under live flowing conditions. They don't purge the line. Um, and... Um, and start um, expanding it. They do it under live flowing conditions and they use stopple fittings. So what, what they do is they utilize our clamp on gas meter to measure the velocity. So they have a chart that says, hey, for, for these different 
pipe sizes, this is the velocity that we need. And that velocity is important for two things. One, it will dissipate the heat under live welding conditions, but also not to have too high a velocity where it will cause a poor weld. Uh, so this is critical, and it's critical to safety um, and can be a risk. So anyone that's going out doing a live welding, they need to have the confidence and the, the assurance that the velocity that they're reading is accurate. And if it's not accurate, it could be very hazardous. So all those diagnostics are, are important to ensure that accurate measurement. And we do you know, training with them on an annual basis to keep everybody um, you know, up to speed with diagnostics and, and making sure that everything is, is, is done properly. So, you know, we like to look at signal wave shapes, you know, that'll tell you if you have any synchronous or asynchronous noise, maybe you don't have a proper pipe wall match with your transducers, um, and that's where you can have that signal to noise ratio issue um, and even signal strength. But here, you know, looking at some of those other key diagnostics are gain. Um, you know, if you start seeing a, a change in the gain, you know, if that gain's going, if it's going up, that means it's it's working a little bit harder. You know, you get something going on inside the pipe, signal to noise ratio. Um, you know, that there is you know typically not going to change over time unless there um, is something else going on with the transmitter. Correlation factor, like I mentioned earlier, you know, that correlation factor is you know continue looking at the upstream and downstream receive signal to see if there's any variations in that. And then percent accepted. How many transmit and receives are accepted? And we're typically on a good installation or we're going to run at 99 to 100%. But one of the most important diagnostics and the first one that anyone should look at is the speed of sound, you know, for liquids or for gases. That speed of sound is a true indicator that you have a, a good installation. You've got the proper pipe outside diameter, the wall thickness, the spacing. I'll give you an example. If you're measuring water and it's 1450 meters per second at 65 degrees Fahrenheit and you're measuring uh, 1600 speed of sound, well, something's not right. Um, you either have the wrong outside diameter or wall thickness or your spacing is wrong. It's something, of, it's, it's about how your transducers were installed and what information was programmed into the transmitter. Um, so you got to look at that. And for gas, if you're at about, you know, 1287 feet per second for a typical gas, that's good. But you start going off by a few percent, you're going to want to look and, um, and, and see if it's some of the geometry and programming or the spacing of the transducers. And the meter is, once it's up and running, it's continually, especially when you have the AGAA table live, it's continually looking at the the, uh, the the table is continue looking at the speed of sound for that gas composition and what the expected speed of sound should be to make sure that there's no error in those two. Otherwise, there's alarming that will go off as well. So wrap up in summary and then uh, get into some questions. You know, again, clamp on field installed with proper evaluation and the proper tools, you can yield a very high accuracy of a half to one percent or better. Um, clamp on ultrasonic meters can measure your actual gross volume flow. Um, that's corrected for viscosity and maybe take that back to a, uh, a through an RTU and a flow computer where you're correcting for the composition of the gas, pressure and temperature dynamically. Um, out in the field, you do have the ability to program the meter uh, by turning on that AGA table and putting in a fixed pressure and temperature if you just want to get a quick Quick measurement, you know, maybe you're doing a lost and unaccounted for study, you're doing a check meter verification. Um, the standard volume flow um, is compensated for pressure and temperature. Again, you can do that as a fixed or with the table on. And then mass flow, that's corrected for density, pressure, and temperature. Uh, the Siemens clamp on gas meter can correct for the theor theoretical flow profile based on actual piping. So if you don't have ideal upstream and downstream conditions, we do have the ability to bring that, um, that accuracy in a little bit tighter and letting the transmitter know what it's going to expect to see um, passing those transducers and correct for that Reynolds number correction dynamically. Uh, critical di diagnostic speed of sound is the first one we always want to look at. Looking at the signal wave shape, gain, signal to noise ratio, 
uh, correlation factor between the upstream and the, and the downstream transmit and receive, and the percent of accepted uh, transmit and receive as well. Taking all that and applying that to a meter package, you know, the clamp-on gas meters can meet AGA9 custody transfer meter package performance requirements. Um, and it's, it's, it's getting your head into the pipe and, and having a, a meter run that meets the AGA9 guidelines. Um, and I'm closing. Think of Siemens and Gilson for your gas measurement instrumentation requirements. So that wraps up that, and I'll uh, I'll leave it open, Matt, for uh, for questions. Here's my contact information as well. Um, you can reach me at that number. And um, this presentation, Jeff, I believe, will be distributed. We've got a link to uh, to join our Siemens LinkedIn unmuted process automation group, where you can learn more about uh, applications and our solutions for them as well. Thank you. Yeah, so one question that did come in was, how long does it take to install the, the clamp-on meter? Uh, it all depends on, on the application. Um, typically, you, you could probably install, uh, you know, I would say with within an hour. Yeah, about an hour. That there might be some preparation, you know, getting stuff settled out in the field. But once you've got everything kind of all laid out, you know, the you got to put the damping material, and I would say about an hour. You know, maybe for a liquid meter, a little bit less. And then once once you start utilizing that transmitter for multiple applications, you know, going from pipe to pipe, um, that that time would be reduced because you know, in many cases, you're going to be just pulling up that that particular uh, that site and um, and going over to that to that installation and probably have a a set of mounting that would be uh, quick connect. So the picture I showed had spring loaded um, bands. We've also got, we also have magnetic mounts, which make it very easy to, uh, to put onto the pipe. And those, that's one set of magnetic mounts that are adjustable through the entire range of our transducers. So, so yeah, approximately an hour. That was my long answer, sorry. Another one's asking if, there is a portable clamp-on UFM battery powered, and what would its accuracy be? Yeah, we do we do not offer um, a clamp-on portable for, uh, for for gas for gas measurement. Um, yeah, we just we we we're just manufacturing designing and manufacturing the the dedicated uh, flow meters. One more. What is the HF factor, and when is it used? So the HF factor is when you start getting past five cycles um, of uh, um, a phase shift, and, and you've got the uh, you know, that correlation Q where you have the difference in the wavelength. So when you're getting into those higher velocities, you know you've got the ability in the transmitter when you're out in the field to look at those diagnostics and to turn that HF factor on, um, and that and that that'll dynamically correct the uh, flow meter for the higher velocities. Okay, so it stops it dropping out when you get up very high velocities. We used that when we were at the uh, season. Uh, beam blowing, Marty? Beam blowing, yes. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Basically with that, what we do is we, we fool the meters into thinking that a flow of about 30 feet a second is zero, and then it will correct both directions. So it gives you a much nicer range. What is considered high velocity? 80 feet, 90 feet. Once we start getting to 80, 90 feet per second is, is, is where we put the HF factor in. Would you lose the low end then? Nope, no. you don't. Nope, not at all. Because you've got about 10 cycles up and 10 cycles down from that point. So it's correcting past zero and negative. So you don't lose anything, but you do gain the high velocities. How firm is the 100 PSI minimum on metal pipe on say schedule 40 and, and 80 metal pipe? Depends how big the pipe is. It, it's gonna it's gonna vary based on the wall thickness and the transducer selection. Uh, so majority of pipe majority of the applications that we work on were roughly around 100 to 
to 200 pounds. Now, if we're working with uh, with compressed air, uh, you know, air is, is 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 a bit more dense. You know, we can measure at uh, you know 70, 80 pounds. So. Typically, when you're doing low pressure and large pipe, though, you need to go direct mount, not not reflect mount, because you you don't have the power for the distance if you catch my drift. So you you keep the shortest path for the pipe you have, so that you get the proper signals. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I, I don't know. I've been talking off and on now, and I can't figure out why, but my speaker went out. Uh, I wanted to comment on the portable. Uh, there is, there are designs on the books for release of a liquid portable uh, in this coming fiscal year. So it, it will be battery operated, but it will not be set up for gas initially. It'll be liquid only at the primary release. And that will be sometime between now and September, October. Would that be intrinsically safe, Eric? No, general purpose only. Yeah, it's basically a 220 in a box. Yeah. Yeah, get First, battery operated, certified class one, div one is very, very difficult. Especially when you have a battery that can last, you know, two or three days. days. Yeah. yeah. Too much energy. Transducers in that case be IS. In other words, could you? Oh, the all right. I see where you're, I see where you're going on this. Let me let me answer yeah. the question without you even having to ask it. The transducers, in and of themselves, if they're not connected, uh, yeah, I know it sounds ridiculous, but not, they're class one div one always. <clears throat> Unfortunately, though, it all depends on the transmitter that they're hooked up to. <clears throat> so even though all sensors or transducers are always class one div one, if they're hooked up to a class one div two. A transmitter, then they're all of a sudden class one div two. And if they're general purpose only transmitter, then the transducers become general purpose because it's the amount of power that is in the lines that affects uh, the approval. And you can't really put barriers or anything in there because that affects the measurement. So if the transmitter is class one div one, then which is also coming out by the way uh, in the next calendar year or so. Uh, then the transducers are class one div one, but it all depends on the transmitter. It has little to do with the, the sensors themselves. I think that that was your question, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Marty and Ron and Eric, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their uh, attendance and uh, and time and attention today. Uh, I will be posting this on the Gilson website in the next day or so, and you can forward and share that link. If you have uh, an application you'd like to discuss, you can reach out to me or to Marty. His contact information is on the screen. And... Uh, Thanks again, and everyone have a safe day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity.